I'm going to talk to you about epidemiolysis bullosa today. Um, the charity Deborah is the charity that supports um, children, adults and families living with EB. So Professor Joe David Fine, who uh, works with EB patients in the States, has described it as the most devastating chronic diseases known to mankind, and you'll probably agree with that by the end of the presentation. What is EB? It's a group, quite a large group, of genetically determined disorders, and the skin and mucous membranes are fragile, and they break down in response to very minimal friction and trauma. There's different types, and the effects will vary from fairly minor blistering of the hands and feet to chronic and progressive disability and even death in early infancy. It's rare, but it's not that rare. So all types, that's including mild and severe, is one in 117,000 live births. And the rarer types, one in 250,000 live births. And my caseload, which goes from the south coast up to Birmingham and then again picks up Scotland, is 430 children. It's inherited, and the inheritance is can be dominant, which tends to be the milder types, or recessive, which is the more severe types. It's diagnosed by a skin biopsy, part of which goes for electron microscopy and the other part for immunohistochemistry. It's my job to go and take the skin biopsy from the baby in the neonatal unit. I never cease to be amazed by the fact I can walk in, say I've come to see baby Jones and take a skin biopsy, and they say, oh, he's in there. Now, I am a mad woman with a knife, but nobody checks my ID, and I even have to ask for help. So, actually, I might need a little bit of help to hold the baby, and maybe a trolley. I think this just shows you how scared people are of babies with severe EB. They actually put them in the cubicle, and thank God the specialist nurse is coming. It doesn't work like that. I'm only there once or twice a week. Four different types of EB. We've got simplex, junctional dystrophic, and Kindler syndrome. I'll just briefly run through these for you once I've told you how EB works, or rather how it doesn't work. If we use the analogy of the brick wall, so the bricks, this is a dry stone wall, uh, the bricks are the epidermis. Where the wall meets the ground is the dermal epidermal junction, and the grass and below will be the dermis. These little building blocks here along the bottom, these are hemidesmosomes. These are like little rivets that hold the skin together, give it strength. And then we have focal contacts, which are like little bolts holding the skin together. And then what would be the mortar in your dry stone wall is actually the desmosomes. And these are very important in all types of EB. These are the very important structural proteins that make your skin strong. Okay, so again, we've got the epidermis here. So these are the minor types of EB, EB simplex, and these bits here are what hold the walls of the cells together. And in dystrophic EB, we've got these little things called anchoring fibrils here, and these are really important in holding that dermis onto your epidermis. And then Kindler syndrome, very confusing then it can occur anywhere, so it could be top, middle, or bottom. And depending on where the level of cleavage is in Kindler's syndrome, you will see um, some scarring, or maybe not some scarring, or maybe just simple blistering. Bit of a frightening slide here. This is really just to show you the different proteins involved in the types of EB, and it's a reduction or absence of these proteins that's going to um, make the skin weak and determine which type of EB it is. So, these top ones are EB simplex, these middle ones are junctional EB, and the ones deep down in the bottom, type 7 collagen, this is dystrophic EB. So, EB simplex, it's a little foot here, which is quite nastily blistered just from wearing soft footwear. So you can have localised EB simplex, and this is just the hands and feet, so simple blistering like we would get but really from doing nothing, maybe just from sitting around inside on a hot day and the feet will spontaneously blister, so very painful. 
Um, more severe types of EB simplex can um, be one that's associated with a muscular dystrophy, which obviously has a very poor outcome. And EB simplex downing mirror, which is a more severe type of EB simplex. Junctional EB tends to be quite severe. This is uh, recessively inherited, so parents have both carriers, healthy carriers, um, no idea they might produce a child with EB, so a terrible shock when the baby's born. The most severe form is Hurlitz junctional, then we have non Hurlitz junctional, which is less severe, and junctional EB with a pyloric atresia, so a blockage to the outlet of the stomach. And again, this is a very serious type of EB. So Hurlitz junction EB, now it can be very mild to start with, and people think, oh, it might be EB, but not too bad. And sometimes the mistake is made of saying to the parents, I think this is quite a nasty blistering disorder, but luckily a mild type. Unfortunately, it progresses quite quickly. The children um, develop widespread blistering and skin loss. The mouth and throat are very fragile. They fail to thrive. Now, I've been told off by dietitians for being out of date. They're supposed to say faltering growth. But actually, these children really fail to thrive. And sometimes when they die, they weigh less than their birth weight. So it's certainly not faltering growth. The larynx is involved. So um, breathing, coughing, crying, all blisters the larynx and leads to quite um, bad respiratory distress. And this type is usually fatal in infancy. And this is one of the babies that was born with very mild presentation, just some nail bed involvement and a couple of missing nails and this child died aged about five or six months. non Hurlitz junction EB, it's not as bad, but it's still a nasty disease. We do lose some babies from this in infancy. Their skin is very fragile. They lose their hair, um, really not much hair at all by the time they're in their 20s. The uh, dental enamel is hyperplastic, so they need a lot of teeth uh, restoration and they can get nail abnormalities. And they're very nasty. They can get bladder and urethral problems, particularly in the boys. And the girls, we've got very good, neat little plumbing. Boys have got tubes and tubes and large yards of it, as far as I can see. They can blister anywhere along that urethra. The lining of the bladder blisters, those intact blisters are tried to be passed via the urethra. Uh, urinary retention, incredibly painful. Catheterization via the urethra makes things worse. So most of our teenage boys with this form of junction EB have actually got suprapubic catheters. Um, it's not very good psychologically and socially, and it still hurts a lot. This is some of the wounds you get in non Hurlitz junction EB, very wet, very difficult, and very chronic. Dystrophic EB is one of our greater challenges because these are our longer-term survivors, but with progressive disability. So it's, in its severe form, it's complete absence of collagen 7. And these collagen 7 forms the anchoring fibres that actually rivet the epidermis onto the dermis. If you haven't got that, any shearing force is just going to take the skin straight off. So this is a blister in severe dystrophic EB. You can see this is the epidermis. This is the dermis. And that level of cleavage there has just torn it straight off. And that would have been from minimal friction. So we've got different types. We've got dominant dystrophic, tends to be mild, mild recessive, severe generalised, which is the worst type, and then other generalised. So lots and lots of problems in severe dystrophic EB. The eyes will blister, very painful. They don't just blister from rubbing. They actually blister when the children open their eyes in the morning because eyes get a little bit dry at night. And the action of opening the eyelid is just going to tear the skin off the cornea, cornea incredibly painful. The mouth blisters and the mouth scars to become small. The esophagus blisters. They often need gastrostomy feeding, which comes with its own problems because the skin doesn't support the tube very well. You get a large hole, you get leakage. They're constipated because they blister around the anal margin and it hurts to go, so they hold back. Joint contractures, which reduces mobility. They're in great pain all the time. They get osteoporosis because we wrap them up. They don't get much vitamin D absorption. They don't have much high impact um, playground activity that builds strong bones. They have delayed puberty, which is your second wave of bone growth. So they get crushed vertebral fractures. On top of all that, 
as I live long enough, so I get skin cancer. This is one of our little babies. This is Maisie. This is what she looked like when she was born. She's got severe dystrophic EB. Um, she, her pain control was minimal. I think she was on paracetamol with all that skin damage. This is interuterine damage. So she started to do this when she started kicking in the womb and it was compounded by a normal vaginal delivery. So these are very long-standing painful wounds. Because she was so distressed, she rubbed her eyes, she's got corneal blistering, she's got blistering on her eyelids. Her mouth is really sore from feeding with a regular teat. Um, both hands and both feet were degloved. As I said, sometimes when faced with the unusual, people lose all sense of what to do. Basic nursing care sometimes goes out of the window. She had a cannula cited for IV antibiotics, which she didn't need. But it was put in this raw little foot. And then they couldn't tape it because the skin was so wet. So it was wrapped up with a bandage. So the time I got to see her, 48 hours later, it was just completely cemented onto her foot. So as gentle as I was and as much analgesia as she had, I think I was crying more than her by the time I got that bandage off. But if you get it right, you can get things healed. And by three weeks, she's lovely. You can all look again now. <laughs> So her feet and hands are healed, she's still very fragile, obviously. She's got scarring, she's got some fresh blistering, but she's got good pain control, she's feeding with a special team, and she's very content. And so it goes on. She's quite a character. She knows more swear words than I do. Um, she just wants to be a regular little girl. You can see she's got some damage here. This was an interesting scenario. She rubbed her forehead. She had this great big thick crust on it. Now she told me it was her friend and it was called Rosie. And she told me this because she was scared of me taking it off. And it was a difficult one. You can't take these kids to theatre at the drop of a hat for everything because there's always something. And they're a huge anaesthetic risk with their microstomia and their fragile mucosa. But we needed a way to get this off. So I showed her Deborah Soft. No, she was not impressed. Now, I think Deborah Soft is great. I know Trudy has discussed that this morning. Then she said to me, I'll use it if it's pink. So I thought, oh, well, it can't do any harm. So I took a whole bunch home, dyed them in a cold water dye, rinsed all the dye off. She put one in the bath with her every night, loads of emollient, and got that crust off. And it wasn't rosy anymore. It was a nasty scab by that stage. This is Maisie, age five. You can see she's getting ready for school. She goes to mainstream school. She has a one-to-one -one carer. She's very popular. She has people queuing up to push her wheelchair in the playground at playtimes. Um, is catching up with her now, though. She's got a lot of scarring. That's mum there doing a blister before she goes to school. She's got quite marked microstomia. And she's getting that very pinched little scarred look that our children get. And they develop progressive contractures because collagen 7 is very important for skin structure and without it you get scarring. The worst contractures are on the hands and they actually cocoon up so you have no digits at all. We have a programme of care to try to reduce this. We bandage quite nicely between the web spaces. We just delays it, but it is inevitable. The only treatment for that is really surgical, um, it's quite aggressive, it's very painful. It means taking a skin graft, which gives us another challenge for the graft site. And um, the effects aren't long lasting, so actually it's not something we promote greatly. We do encourage, if they've got cocooning, that perhaps they'll just have the thumb release, because if you've got that movement, you can do quite a lot really. Squamous cell carcinomas is a later complication of dystrophic EB. Um, this is one of my patients. It's a 14-year-old again, a nasty crust. He loved it. They love their crusts because you can't see the wound. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't, his leg didn't stick to his trousers. Didn't need a dressing. They don't like their dressings much. But with a lot of persuasion, we did manage to get, that, get him to remove that and to find these, as I suspected, these two very nasty tumours, which subsequently was squamous cell carcinoma. 
These are multiple primaries, mainly over the body, bony prominences, so hands, feet, knees, canica and the esophagus. 70 times more likely to get the squamous cell carcinoma if you have dystrophic EB. And the average life expectancy after the first tumour is five years. And the youngest reported um, has been age six in America. Um, the youngest we've seen is 10 years old. So while this used to be said to be a disease of adults, it's actually happening much earlier than we had realised. So treatment's just surgical, or if it's near a major artery, it would be um, palliative radi radiotherapy. So Kindler syndrome is our fourth type of EB. This is quite a new addition to the EB family, really. The neonates have skin fragility and blistering. The skin then changes to have poculoderma atrophy, and you need a lot of sun protection. There is a raised risk of tumours. If the... Um, underlying gene defect is, is low down in the skin, there will also be stricture formation. So what are we going to do with our skin care? Try to avoid friction and shearing forces, avoid tapes, take the neonates out the incubator. We love putting sick babies in incubators. Usually these babies aren't sick and if they're in an incubator, the heat and the humidity will make them blister more. If they're nursed naked, they'll rub their legs together and take all their skin away. Try not to take the Guthrie test from the heel. Take off the cord clamp, it's a big bit of hard plastic. Just put a ligature on and take it off. Take off the identification band because that will rub. Align the nappy. Um, this is the picture here of an identification band on a baby's ankle. Just put on and the baby grow was put on over the top. And when the nappy was changed, it was realized that it had dug right into the foot there. We run a neonatal outreach service because actually transporting babies hundreds of miles across the country to a specialised centre is going to make them lose a lot of skin. This child had intact skin when he left the neonatal unit. Handling issues. Um, just modify your handling. Don't not cuddle the children. Um, never lift them up from under the arms because you will get these nasty wounds in the axilla which are very hard to dress and very hard to heal and will scar and contract. This is a handprint on a baby's foot, so this is the thumb and the fingers around the other side, that will be from nappy changing. So we wrap a piece of soft gauze or dressing around the legs before we lift them. This is a handprint on a baby's bottom, that's from getting out of the scales, so leave your baby dressed or, nurse, or put them on a soft towel and then weigh the clothes and the towel afterwards. And this is horrible, this is degloving injury. So this is what happens when you hang on to the fingers of someone with dystrophic EB. That was a vena puncture, um, let go if the child pulls away. And it, it's, it's quite mean, but we try not to um, encourage people to hold the hands of children with dystrophic EB, particularly in the classroom situation because children, one will go faster than the other and pull on the hand. And that's devastating for everybody. More handling damage, another degloving injury there in a neonate. You can see the skin's just like a ripe peach. You put your thumb on it, you slide your thumb, and the skin will slide off. Um, these are thumbprints on the back of a little boy, and this was at nursery. And he was sitting on a bench without a back, and he leant back, and his carer just put her hands on his shoulders, stop him falling on the floor quite the right thing to do. The wrong thing was letting him sit on a bench in the first place, but, you know, people learn as they go along. Anything sticky will cause a lot of problems. Um, this was an ECG monitor. This is the little square blister pertaining to the square sticky tape on the nappy. We've all done it. Wrigley baby miss, stick it on the belly instead. Silicon medical adhesive removes have been a fantastic invention and revolutionised the care of EB, really. So if an accident happens, you have the means to take it off. And in small babies and children that don't like sprays or on the face, it now comes in a, a liquid sachet form. This is one of our babies with Hurlitz Junction EB who um, 
was getting damage from the retention, so the silicone medical adhesive removers mean we can use something sticky, isolated on one wound and take it off safely. Um, this baby was having problems with laryngeal disease and copious secretions, and we didn't want to have to suction her mouth and oropharynx because we'd strip her oral mucosa. So we were able to use sticky medicated patches with hyacinium, which meant that the secretions were reduced. So why don't they heal? Well, not just because they've got EB, they're compromised healers. They have anemia from blood loss, anemia from chronic disease. They're malnourished, frequent infections. They itch like mad, and it's very hard to control the itch. So just when something's nearly healed, you think, oh, I might get in there. They'll scratch it off. Pain, which obviously has a detrimental effect on wound healing. And then, of course, because they have got EB, the skin, once it's healed, isn't going to be strong and it's likely to break down again. We must lance those blisters. We had a discussion in the workshop yesterday about whether to lance blisters or not. You must do it in EB. These blisters are not self-limiting. They will get to this size. This is a toe on a 10-week-old baby, completely encased in a blister, very painful. And the relief they get when you lance those is amazing because the, the tenseness of those blisters is acutely painful. So just with a hypodermic needle, let the fluid out of that. Um, don't let them get that big. I tend to lance them as soon as you can see them. And the older children are very good at doing them themselves. What sort of dressing? Well, there's a multitude out there. We can't use them all, but we can use a lot of them. Sometimes the type of EB will tell me what, what will suit the child whether they need protection, whether they're a toddler, whether they want to play football, whether unfortunately you've got a climber that's always on the top of the high chair, how wet the wound is, whether it's infected, and then of course patient choice, you know, so we, we love polymen for our patients, it's great. Unfortunately it's pink, it doesn't come in blue, you cannot get it on a child, on a boy of about, about age six, they won't have it. Um, Soft silicone, it's fantastic, but even that can be a little hard for the most delicate patients. You can see it's just torn the skin there. And dressings can cause a lot of damage if they're not used properly. So this was a piece of Tubifast with a hole cut for the thumb. And soft as Tubifast is, it, it rubbed the blister there. This is soft silicone mesh with a little blister pertaining to each of the holes. Um, this is just a bad technique, really. It's a joint, there's a lot of movement. You put a big dressing on it, not a little narrow one, and that's going to cut into the skin. And anybody with EB simplex who's worse than the heat, if you put a big foam dressing on, then the heat from the foam might well cause blistering underneath it. Critical colonization and infection is a huge challenge for us, as you can imagine. Um, very difficult to get my patients in the bath when they're a little bit older. They don't like it, they don't like to see all their wounds, they're contracted, um, it hurts to get in, it hurts to get out, it's too much really. So, and you can't even cleanse the wounds. So, we, use, we tend to, sorry, we tend to use um, dressings with a cleanser in them or just some means of cleaning them up a little bit, a topical antimicrobial. It's very important to keep the odour down as well. So what we work on really is improving quality of life and sometimes we can't save the lives, quite often we can't, but we can improve things. So this is a little baby, again with Herlitz Junction EB, so very life limited and the traditional sort of EB dressings were causing more and more problems as we went on. So I just switched to something very simple, we heard about simple techniques um, this morning. This was just intracyte conformable just placed on and secured with a tubular bandage. So from this, which was caused all by the edges of the dressings, we went to this. Now clearly this child is dying. Um, she's got acute cachexia there. She's uh, tiny and you think this is, this is her hips here. This is a 13 month old baby and this is what I meant by um, faltering growth not being a good enough term. She actually did die weighing the same as her birth weight. But amazingly, the skin was in really good condition, actually. 
you know, we couldn't save her life, but it meant so much to her parents that she didn't have those horrible wounds right up until the time she died. So there's another child with Hurlitz Junction EB, again, really horrible chronic wounds. Um, didn't live very long at all. This child died at about 13 weeks of age. But again, we got really good healing, and actually this leg here did go on to heal. And that meant a huge amount to the mother because their leg used to bleed and bleed and she was terrified this child was going to bleed to death on her kitchen table where we did the dressings. So actually getting that leg to heal meant so much to everybody. This is one of our little longer term survivors. This is um, little Harry. Um, he's got a tracheostomy which is causing lots of problems for us but it's keeping him alive. They tend to get these horrible chronic facial conservations, which is just dreadful for everybody. What we do is we treat with, um, quite controversially, okay, um, a very strong, potent topical steroid. You can get really good healing. Um, his forehead has actually gone on to heal now. The difference that that's made to that child's life is parents feel they can take him out. He goes to nursery, he goes to the park. Whereas before they wouldn't take him because they were accused of beating him up, burning and all sorts of things. Nutrition, very important. I'll just briefly touch on this. So, so the sore mouths we can get, we use a Haberman feeder, which has got a long teat with a valve in it, which just means the babies can have a weak suck and get a good delivery of feed. This is an older child showing you the very small mouth they get, and the gastrostomy feeding. They get esophageal strictures, and we can inflate these using a a guide wire in interventional radiology, and we can inflate these strictures. Now, this is one operation the children want time and time again because they like to eat. They don't like food getting stuck. We book all the slots in interventional radiology just before Christmas so they can eat their Christmas dinner. Pain, um, something we're very aggressive with. We also use our symptom care team to help us, so we'll address mild pain, Severe pain, chronic background pain, and there's often a, an element of neuropathic pain as well because it's an abnormal response to pain that's been there for a long time. So we would use things like amitriptyline for that. And then some topical pain relief, we use topical morphine in hydrogel, it's very effective. Sometimes we use the um, dressings with ibuprofen. Unfortunately, they're not licensed for the under 12s, and our children do have a lot of non-steroidals, so we tend to keep those for palliation. Um, unorthodox pain treatments. This child has no pain if he has his dog next to him while he's having his dressings done. This child with dystrophic EB has acute juvenile rheumatoid arthritis as well. Very severe hip pain, disappears when she's on a horse. Patient choice, um, this child presented in clinic with this unusual blister on the foot. It was caused by these sandals. So do you have to wear those? She said, yes, they're really pretty. Okay. So new treatments, because that's been quite depressing, I know. It's not depressing for me working with it, but the, just seeing the pictures is hard, because you can't do anything about it. But the children are really bubbly and interactive, and um, it's a very rewarding job. But we are getting there. Ex vivo gene therapy, bone marrow transplants, these have been done in America. The success rates are not great because a lot of the children die from the conditioning pre to the treatments, so we're not going to go down those routes. Fibroblast injections around the edge of a chronic wound have uh, produced great healing. But we're very excited because at Great Ormond Street Hospital later this year, we're going to start stem cell infusions for children with dystrophic EB, and that hopefully will boost the collagen 7. You only need 30% collagen 7 to have functioning skin, you don't need 100%, um, and hopefully reduce some of all the inflammation and problems they get from that. So thank you very much.